All right, well, this evening we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, verse 52, but I thought I would just simply read from verse 40 through 52 so we can get a little bit of the context here. Those of you who have been joining us on Wednesday nights, you'll know that uh, Sinclair Ferguson had some interesting things to say about this text. We do need to remember that what we see here is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, leading him in the good and right way. Jesus submitted to that. He learned. He grew. He grew in various ways um, and ways that were, again, pleasing to the Father. Let's remember that he's given us his spirit as well in the new covenant to work this same transformation in our lives so that we might become like Jesus. So this is what we read beginning in verse 40. The child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our edification this evening. Now, I've already told you this evening uh, we are coming to an end, uh, coming to the end of a short series on the Ten Commandments, uh, which we called the Rules of the Christian Race. Uh, again, thinking about Eric Little and the kind of life that he lived, and of course, everyone who pleased the Lord lived according to these commandments. Now, throughout the series, we've been reviewing the commandments themselves. We did have a couple of, uh, I think, three sermons on basically motivation, but for the most part we've been looking at what the commandments teach us regarding how we might love God and how we might love our neighbor. But what I'd like to do this evening is to focus on the motivations uh, behind why we are to do this. I'd like to take just a few moments to review the reasons that we should keep them that we've seen thus far and then look at one more as we close off this series. Now, the first and most obvious reason we should keep these commandments is because this is what our Lord actually calls us to do. This is His commandment. He has authority to tell us what to do. And, of course, that's enough by itself. We've also seen in the New Covenant that He gives us the power to do it. Now, one of the things that we looked at first off was to uh, look at the evidence that the Ten Commandments are not just for the Old Covenant. But they're basically God's will, his, his moral standard for us in whatever epic of redemptive history that we happen to be in. We do believe that the Lord wrote these commandments on Adam's heart and gave him the power to keep them. Uh, we believe that, of course, when the Lord uh, gave his commandments on Mount Sinai, he was simply writing in stone or codifying what the people of God already knew. And of course, in the New Covenant, we see that Jesus did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but rather he came to fulfill and to write these laws upon our hearts. Basically, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then 
annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus goes on from there to talk about what the, how the scribes and Pharisees view the law, how they were mistaken, and how it should be kept. And he says that is the way that we should keep it. And of course, if we have his spirit, we have the ability to do that. Now Jesus didn't obey the commandments or fulfill them in order to do away with them. He fulfilled them to save us. His work didn't make it possible for us to go to heaven without obedience or without keeping them, but rather he made it possible for us to keep them through the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember the blessing of the new covenant. You know, the old covenant as it's contrasted with the new covenant. Uh, they did not continue in my ways and I did not care for them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant I'm going to make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord says, I will take my law and put it in their minds and I will write it upon their hearts and I shall be their God and they shall be my people. Yes, the Lord came to Israel and he saved those that, well, that trusted in him. And then, of course, when they rejected him as a nation, he turned to the Gentiles. But this is the work of the new covenant. God takes the law and he writes it upon our hearts by his spirit. He gives us the ability to obey. He gives us a love for that standard. So the gospel is not only about Jesus freeing us from the guilt that would have pressed us down into hell forever, it's also about his freeing us from the power of sin by giving us the ability to obey God's commandments. Now secondly, we've been emphasizing the fact that we should keep the commandments because they are the very definition of what it means to love God and to love our neighbor. They are the unpacking or the spelling out of what we call the golden rule, which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As you would have others to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He had the Spirit of God. He had the law written on his heart. He loved God. He loved his neighbor. And he is the example that we are called to follow. Uh, we should keep the commandments because not to do so is to resist what the Spirit of God is actually doing in our lives. When we, when we don't obey, when we don't yield and submit to what the Spirit of God is doing as he seeks to lead us in the ways of the Lord, it grieves him. It, it offends him. It, it quenches that love that he has created in our souls. And when that happens, we lose some of the power that he has given us to keep those commandments. So as we resist him, we grow weaker. But as we yield to him, we grow stronger. So we need to yield to the Spirit of God. And then finally, we saw that we should keep them because it's only when we keep the commandments that we are really loving Jesus I think that's important to see. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And again, we've already stressed the point that his commandments are the same as the Ten Commandments. Now, if our love does not go beyond what we feel, you know, we, we say, I feel this love for Jesus, I love him in my heart. If it doesn't go beyond that, if it doesn't go what we, beyond what we say regarding the Lord Jesus, oh, I, I love the Lord and we pray and we worship and so forth. If it doesn't go beyond what we tell others what we think about Jesus, if it doesn't show itself in what we do, in actual obedience, then the Lord is telling us that what we have is not really love. Love works itself out in our actions. James tells us that this same principle is true with regard to our love for one another. Uh, it's one thing to feel love. It's another thing to wish them well, to say we love them. But we're not really loving them unless we actually help them if they're in need. That's what James tells us in um, James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm, and be filled. 
And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. James is telling us that wishing somebody well when they're in need is not love. Meeting their need is love. It's not what you feel, it's not what you say, but it's what you do that expresses love. John writes essentially the same thing in 1 John 3, verses 17 and 18. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Jesus is telling us the same principle applies with regard to our love for him. Saying we love him isn't love. Doing what he tells us to do, that's what he says is love. So it's important that we keep the commandments. And again, remember, not to justify ourselves, but to show our love to the Lord Jesus Christ. And not on our own strength and our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us the ability to do this. Now tonight, let's consider one more reason why we should keep the commandments. And that is because when we do, we gain the Lord's favor. In other words, it pleases God. Uh, we should want to please Him, of course, if we, if we love Him. We want to show Him that love, as we've just seen. But we also need to consider that if we do this, if we actually please the Lord, that He has also promised to give us certain blessings. And those blessings basically amount to greater usefulness. And of course, if you love the Lord, that's what you want to be, is more useful to Him. So what I'd like us to do this evening in closing this is to look at two things. The first one is this amazing statement that Jesus grew in favor with God. I mean, Jesus was able to gain more favor, as it were, to be more pleasing to the Lord. And secondly, that the Lord has given us His Spirit so that we might do the same thing. So first of all, Jesus grew in favor with God. And really, as we see how He did this, this, this is... Um, where we get to see how we may do the same. Luke writes again in verse 52 of Luke chapter 2. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Uh, by the way, I didn't put this in the notes, but verse 40 in our reading says, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We're going to come back to wisdom here in just a moment. Now as Jesus grew, uh, Luke says he kept increasing. He was making progress. He was advancing and that in three areas. First of all, he advanced in wisdom. Now wisdom, sometimes we see wisdom as being basically synonymous with knowledge, but they really are two different things. Wisdom is related to knowledge, but it's not quite the same thing. Knowledge is knowing. Knowing the facts, knowing how facts relate to one another, while wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge or facts to a particular problem in order to solve it. Now, in the Jewish culture, wisdom is the ability to use what you know about God and His will to live the kind of life that He calls you to live. Now, my premier example of that is uh, the book of wisdom which the Lord has given to us that was written by the wisest man who has ever lived outside of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the book of Proverbs. Now, why did Solomon write this book? He wrote it to teach us wisdom. But not just you know, wisdom about animals and various types of things, but rather wisdom on how to take the law of God and to apply it to everyday situations so that the decisions we make would be those that are pleasing to the Lord. This is what he tells us in the beginning of the book in Proverbs 1 verses 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, 
and equity. By the way, those are, again are, are names for love, you know, which is what the law of God teaches us. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And again, as you look through the book, you understand that what he's doing is taking the moral law, he's taking the Ten Commandments, and he's applying it to life. He's even drawing lessons from nature to help promote those, that ethical principle that is in the commandments. Now, this is the first area Jesus grew in, his ability to take what he learned and to live it out. He learned wisdom. Now, Jesus also advanced in stature, that is, he got taller. <laughs> That's, there's not much really to say about that. He was growing up, okay? But he also advanced in God's favor and in man's favor. Now, I think it's easy to understand how Jesus might have gained favor in the eyes of his neighbors. I mean, just, just consider the account we just read of how when Jesus was 12, he was in the temple and he was talking with the teachers in the temple and so forth. And they were amazed at his understanding. I, I would take it at least at this particular age when they didn't feel threatened by Jesus. They probably thought, this, is a guy, this boy's a wonder boy. I wish my kid was like this. He seems to have an interest in the commandments of God and the law of God in the scriptures. Uh, they favored, I think, Jesus. But again, he grew in favor with all of his neighbors. Now, they didn't really know him. Of course, he came into the world as a child. And they didn't know what he was going to become like as he was just a child, just like we're not going to know what a child is going to be like until it begins to grow and develop. And as it does, we begin to see uh, his or her character expressed as they observed Jesus growing up, as they saw how he lived, how he honored his parents, how he was courteous and polite to those around him. Jesus grew in their esteem. What he did was pleasing to all men. Again, as a child, he wasn't a threat yet. Uh, when he got older and he began to preach, well, then that's when the opposition started. But how did Jesus grow in God's favor? In the eyes of the one who already knew him and the one who loved him with an infinite love. Well, first of all, I think we have to be able to distinguish between love and favor. Sometimes they follow on one another, but they can, I think, be distinguished. The Father's love for Jesus certainly was always consistent. This was His beloved Son. This was the one who was His exact image. This is the one whom He loved with an infinite love from all eternity. But, on the other hand, there was something new that was taking place here. This is the first time that his son had become a man. And again, understanding that the son of God is still the eternal son of God. He doesn't give up his divinity, but he is the person in that child. This is the first time that he had experienced, as it were, human life and lived as a man. And as the father watches his son grow up and he observes how his son is living, his pleasure in him grew. Now, what is it that he saw in his son that was so pleasing to him? Well, it wasn't that Jesus was growing taller. I mean, sometimes we, you know, as parents, we delight in the fact that our children are getting up, and they certainly delight in the fact that when they put their you know, back against that, uh, you know, that door jam or whatever it is you're, you're measuring your children, and they get a little bit taller, they get a great deal of delight from that. You know, they want to grow so high. Well, that isn't exactly what was interesting to the Father, but that Jesus was growing in wisdom. That is what pleased him. Jesus was listening to what the Father said, and he was seeking uh, to live a life that was honoring to him. Now, I think as parents, we can perhaps appreciate and understand this difference between the two things, between love and between favor. You know, we all love our children. I think sometimes, irrespective of how they live, because they are our children, but our pleasure in them varies. 
as we see them either doing what is right or doing what is wrong. And it's for this reason that sometimes parents can favor one child over another. And we, of course, we need to be careful as parents that we try not to do that, but we know that can happen. But even if we do, it doesn't mean that we love any of them any less because we might favor one more. Now, as the father watched his son, he was pleased with what he saw. And Jesus grew in his favor. Now, why did Jesus give us his Holy Spirit? Well, it was that he might do the same thing for us and that we might be led to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived, that we might take his commandments and that we might apply them to our lives so that we too might grow in God's favor, that we might be pleasing to him. Now, one thing I'd like for us to, to see here this evening is this, and that is that knowledge isn't enough by itself. It's a means to an end, but it's not the end. Uh, theology is good. I love theology. I love systematic theology. I love, I love to study it. I love to see how it all fits together, what the Bible reveals about God and his plan and all those things, and see how they all fit together. I, I love studying that, but that in and of itself is not enough to please God. You can be the greatest theologian on earth and still not be pleasing to the Father if you're not actually applying that theology. And biblical knowledge, uh, make a little bit of a distinction here because some people read the Bible and they, they just take you know, bits and pieces of it and maybe they don't see the whole picture, how it all fits together, but they still get truth from here and they, they learn certain things like what God did to save us, what Jesus and the apostles taught, how we are to live. Uh, you learn where to find things in Scripture, but you know what? You can know your Bible inside and out. You can know everything there is to know that God reveals in here, although I have to say that guardedly because nobody really can. But that in and of itself is, is not enough to please the Father. Having a lot of knowledge without applying what we know doesn't really do us any good. Uh, we read in Luke 13 in verses 23 through 27 an instance where basically there were those who heard what Jesus was teaching but in the end, we're going to be rejected because they didn't actually apply it. On one occasion, someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. It's not enough to hear. It's not enough to know. You need to apply it. They heard, but they didn't apply it. Now, when Jesus says, strive to enter by the narrow door, what he is saying is, take what you have learned from the Lord and apply it to your life with a great deal of zeal. You know, do it, what he says. If we don't apply what we know, then what we know isn't going to do us any good. As a matter of fact, if we never apply what we hear, if we never apply anything that we know, it will actually work against us in the end rather than helping us. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples as he sent them out to teach and to preach in Matthew 10, verses 14 and 15, whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. More knowledge can actually work against you. It can mean greater judgment if you don't know the Lord Jesus. Thankfully, that's not going to happen to anyone who is trusted in the Lord. But there will still be consequences. God will still deal with us as a father deals with children. And he will not let us just continue to do things that are wrong. We need to hear and we need to apply. James tells us this in James 1 verses 22 through 25. 
But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Not the one who knows but doesn't do, but the one who knows and who does. He will be blessed because in doing this, he will please God and he will gain God's favor. Now this, I believe, is the key to usefulness in the kingdom of heaven when we can apply what we know to become the kind of person he wants us to be. And this is what the Spirit of God is leading us to do. This is what we will do if we have the Spirit dwelling within us. <clears throat> now, why should we care whether or not we have God's favor? Again, if we divide between love and favor, you know, if God loves me and He saved me in Christ, what, what does it matter whether, you know, I gain, grow in favor with the Lord? Well, I hope you understand that that sounds like a pretty bad question. We should want above all things to please God because He made us, because He takes care of us, because He saved us. Uh, you know, every Lord's Day morning we have the Lord's table and we remember what, what Jesus has done for us. We should want to please Him above all things, but again, we have the Spirit within us and that's what the Spirit does. He gives us the desire, He gives us the ability actually to please Him. But I want us to see too that there are certain advantages to growing in His favor. I think this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I think these things are certainly true. When we please the Lord, we actually gain a greater intimacy with the Lord, and perhaps that's the most important thing. I mean, even in the life of Jesus, we see that He favored certain of His disciples above others. They were admitted to places to see things and experience things that others were not, such as on the Mount of Transfiguration or in the Garden of Gethsemane. Greater usefulness is certainly uh, one of the blessings that would be ours for pleasing the Lord. The apostles that Jesus called were used by Jesus because they were the ones that God favored and gave to His Son, with the exception, of course, of Judas, who was called for another purpose. I think understanding that we have God's favor, that He's pleased with us, that with that comes a greater assurance, certainly with the intimacy that we share with the Lord and the usefulness comes a greater assurance that we belong to Him. Sometimes we struggle in the area of assurance, wondering whether or not we're even true believers. Usually we struggle, though, in that area when we're not living the kind of life He calls us to live. When we grieve and quench the Spirit of God, we not only lose that love that He get, creates in us for the things of the Lord, but we also lose a sense, not entirely, thankfully, but we lose a great deal of the sense of His love for us. So living a life that's pleasing to the Lord also brings greater assurance. We have greater confidence in our access to the Lord. And so greater answers to prayer because we have greater faith. We have greater faith because we have more of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Spirit of God is the one who produces faith. And the more faith we have, the more we trust the Lord, the more we believe His promises, the more we're going to uh, basically pray and ask for these things and know that we will receive them. Jesus says, if you pray believing, you will receive. You have to have faith to believe that this is what He wants you to have and that He will give it to you if you ask. And we will have more power in our service to the Lord as, again, the Spirit of God anointed Jesus in His three offices of prophet, priest, and king. There's a sense in which He anoints us to do similar things as prophets of, of the Lord to be His ambassadors to proclaim His gospel, which is what the Lord calls us to do. We'll have more power to do that. And as priests who offered sacrifices, we'll have more of the ability to sacrifice ourselves, to offer ourselves up for the Lord's service. Those who honor the Lord, He will honor, even as the Lord honored His Son because His Son honored Him and pleased Him. 
Now again, going back to the Reformation series, why was the Lord willing to use those that we were looking at during the Reformation series? Well, He was willing to use them because they were usable. They were moving in the direction He wanted them to move. And of course, they were doing that only by His grace, but we do need to understand we can resist the Spirit of God and we be, can become, in a large measure, useless. God used them because they were moving in the right direction. They were yielding to the Spirit of God. They were applying His Word. They were living it. Why did the Lord hear and answer their prayers? Again, I keep going back to the Reformation series, not this past year, but the year before, and George Mueller, and that amazing example of when he uh, was fogbound on a ship and on his way to Quebec and still several days out and they weren't able to move because they didn't, you know, wasn't safe. And uh, he took the captain down into the hold of the ship and he said, let's pray. And, and he offered a very simple prayer. Just, Lord, please remove this fog. I believe it's your will that I be in Quebec. Please take away this fog so I can get there. And when the captain began to pray, he says, you don't need to pray. He goes, I know you don't believe that God's going to do anything about this. And I know that he's heard me. So they went up on, uh, you know, up on the deck of the ship after just those few moments of being in the hold and the fog was all gone. Why is it that the Lord heard George Mueller's prayer and answered it? Well, it's because George Mueller listened to him and he did what he said. I mean, he spent his whole life giving himself to the Lord's service and he had prayed and asked for many things in his life and had seen the Lord answer those prayers. He knew that God would not fail him. That shows his faith. And it also shows us, again, a, a heart that was submitted to the Lord. He was useful to the Lord, and the Lord answered his prayer. And why did the Lord honor these individuals that we were looking at? Well, it's because they honored him. They pleased him. We read in 1 Samuel 2, verse 30, Those who honor me, the Lord says, I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Perhaps you recognize this from Chariots of Fire. It was Jackson Schultz, I think, who was perhaps a believer who shared this with um, uh, Eric Little. He knew that Eric Little didn't run on, on Sunday on the Lord's Day because of conviction. And Schultz believed that the Lord was going to honor Eric Little on that day. So he gives him this note and says, those who honor me, I will honor. And it's certainly true. The Lord honored Eric Little because he sought to honor him. If we honor the Lord, there are, if, if, we, well, if we do that, if we please Him, we'll grow in His favor, and as we grow in His favor, we gain certain blessings, at least more of these blessings. Now, the last thing, the last question that we want to look at briefly is this, and, and this is fairly simple. How can we do more of what pleases the Lord to gain His favor? Well, in order to do that, we just need one thing. We need more of His Holy Spirit. Jesus had the Spirit of God, as Sinclair Ferguson was reminding us, as his intimate companion, his guide who was with him from basically his conception all the way through to his, to his death and beyond, to teach him, to guide him, and to empower him. Jesus was the kind of man that he was and lived the kind of life that he did because he had the Holy Spirit. And that was part of Jesus' dependence as a man uh, to live the kind of life that we're called to live. He, he lived in the same circumstances that, that Adam and Eve would have lived in, and of course uh, we would have if they hadn't uh, fallen. But Jesus had the Spirit of God to do this in the new covenant. He has given us His Spirit to do the same for us. But there is something that we need to do. Remember, sanctification is a cooperative effort. We need to be filled with the Spirit now, that's actually a command. Paul commanded the Ephesians, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, don't be under the influence of alcohol, which makes you drunk and really unable to serve the Lord. Don't be filled with wine or drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with His influence. Yield to Him. Use those means the Lord has given to us to gain more of the influence of the Spirit. And don't grieve Him and don't quench Him but rather follow Him and submit to Him. We need to be under His influence if we're going to live this kind of life. We can't be under the influence of our flesh because that's basically adverse to God. 
We can't be under the influence of the world because the world and its system is not of the Lord and those who love the world really do not love God. We can't, I mean, at least we, we do have, of course, that divided heart in that sense. But if our heart is fully for the world and not for the Lord, obviously we don't love the Lord. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with His influence. So to gain it, I've already said, we need to make sure we don't resist Him and quench Him, but there are things we need to do. God has given us His Word for a reason. And when we read it, we don't just gain knowledge. We also gain the influence of the Spirit because this is what the Spirit of God uses to influence our lives. He illumines the pages of Scripture. He shows us things from the Word. He shows us the beauty of this way of living. He gives us the desire to go this direction. He doesn't just do it out of the blue. He works through the Word of God. We need to be in the Word. We also need to pray. You know, it, there's a big difference between praying because you want something and praying because you know you need to pray. There's a big difference between lifting up a simple prayer that encompasses everything you might do during the day and spending some time earnestly seeking the Lord for particular things that you're going to do during the day. It was said of Martin Luther, remember, that he would pray two hours, I think it was, or it was either an hour or two hours every morning. Unless it was a very busy day, then he would pray for three hours. Now, usually when we face a busy day, we cut out the prayer and we, we lift up a simple little prayer and we kind of go on, not realizing that we're making the rest of the day incredibly difficult because we haven't really asked for the Lord's help and blessing, the help of His Holy Spirit. We need to be in prayer. And we need to be in fellowship, ministering our gifts to one another, building one another up, encouraging one another with the faith that the Lord has given to us. And then as we gain this influence of the Holy Spirit, we need to make sure we yield to the Holy Spirit and we don't resist Him. Now, if we do these things, we will be able to live lives that are more pleasing to the Lord than we would otherwise. And as we do that, we will gain His favor. And with His favor, we'll also find that He will bless us. He will be pleased to use us more. He will show us greater answers to prayer. And He will give us more power in our service to Him. And that, I believe, is what all of us as Christians really desire. So again, we've seen the standard God would have us to live by. Let's remember how we can keep that and why we should keep that. Where does the power come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. Why should we do this? Because it pleases the Lord, loves man, loves God. Uh, this is what our Lord calls us to be, and this is what it means to be transformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord give us greater grace to be able to do this. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.